Perfect. So Manuel, thanks for the great introduction. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm basically an outsider to, to Bitcoin. Um, I think I have some, some basic knowledge, but uh, not I don't really have an agenda. So I just uh, took this as a chance to look at the data and uh, let's see what the data tells us. So Manuel basically <clears throat> paved the way for this presentation. So I don't have to um, talk about much anymore what this talk to flow models. Instead, I will just uh, dive a bit deeper into the Bitcoinometric aspect. So the whole um, motivation for this talk to flow model um, to a large extent essentially comes from this graph um, that shows this nice um, and strong correlation between the stock to flow ratio and the Bitcoin price over time. But the question then really is, is this really just correlation or is there maybe a more fundamental relationship between these two things? So let's start with uh, how this whole analysis began. Um, and suppose we were running just a simple um, ordinary least first regression of the log Bitcoin price on the log of the stock to flow ratio. What we would get uh, would be a highly statistically significant coefficient beta um, of magnitude about 3, 3.1. Uh, so what does it mean? What would it mean? It would mean if the stock to flow ratio goes up by 1%, then the Bitcoin price would be expected to be to go up by roughly 3%. So obviously given that at each halving event, the stock to flow ratio doubles, um, that would be a substantial implied price increase. But um, maybe we should be a bit uh, cautious here because what we might be wanting here could just be a uh, so-called spurious regression. The spurious regression problem could arise if we have what non-stationary variables in our model. These are, in simple words, variables that tend to have a substantial trending behavior over time, which we have just seen in both the price and the stock to flow ratio. Let's give a, another example. Um, let's remove uh, the stock to flow ratio from the picture, but instead add the non-EU net migration into the United Kingdom. And again, we see a substantial positive correlation. Um, but I think you all agree with me that this is just a coincidence and no one would probably argue that the, e the UK migration pattern has anything fundamentally to do with the Bitcoin price. So this is really just a spurious correlation. And then the question is, well, with the stock to flow ratio, is it maybe also just spurious or is it more fundamental? Essentially such a problem that you observe such high correlations um, could always happen if you have such so-called non-stationary variables. So let's uh, go a bit into the Bitcoin metrics. What does it actually mean that the variable is non-stationary? A stationary variable, in simple words, is a variable that has a constant mean, a constant variance, and constant autocovariances over time. So if you look at the lower right panel here, that's a typical stationary variable. It just fluctuates over time. Um, around this constant uh, mean close to zero. It never really deviates far from this mean and quickly reverts back to the mean whenever it deviates. So that's what we uh, call the stationary level. Um, if we move up to the upper right picture, we see one case of a non-stationary level because clearly the mean is not constant over time. The mean constantly increases, essentially this variable follows a linear time trend. But once we essentially remove this linear time trend, we essentially get the stationary process down here. That's exactly how these two pictures are related. From the top to the below, we get by removing this linear time trend. And that's why we call this top right process a trend stationary process. Once we remove the trend, it becomes a stationary process. Now let's move to the top left picture. That process looks actually very similar to the top right picture. It also fluctuates 
more or less around some linear time trend. But once we remove this linear time trend, we go down to the bottom left picture, we see that this process actually takes much, much longer until it reverts back to the zero line here. So it stays away for a substantial period of time from the zero line. And essentially, there's not even a guarantee, even though it happens here by chance, that this process would ever revert back to the zero line. This is a so-called a random walk. What's a random walk? A random walk technically is just a process that at any point in time, um, its value would be determined just by the previous period's value, x t minus one, plus some random shock. So it could just randomly move, move up or randomly move down. And importantly, any of these shocks that occur essentially has a permanent effect. If you have a positive shock, what does it need to bring us back to the previous level? It needs an equivalent negative shock in the future. Without such a negative shock in the future, we would not revert back. That's very different to a stationary process. For stationary process, even if you have a positive shock and nothing happens afterwards, this process would gradually, sooner or later, revert back to the um, long run mean. That's not what's happening with the random walk. Each step is really just random, which basically gives this process its name, a random walk. And then if you look to the upper left picture once again, um, if in addition this process tends to drift away into a certain direction, um, then we would call it a random walk with drift. And what's also very typical about these random walks is that even if you have the same um, process in nature, just by drawing a different sequence of random shocks, these processes can look very different uh, compared to the previous ones. While the stationary or trans-stationary processes, even if you draw different shocks, still look very similar compared to before. That's again a, a distinguishing feature between a non-stationary and a stationary process. So let's look at these two random walks that we've just seen together in one picture. Um, on the left hand side, we have the random walk with drift. Both trend upwards because they have the same underlying um, drift. And if we just look at their overall correlation over time, it's substantial, 0.74 in this case, mainly because they have the same underlying time trend, the same underlying drift. But clearly, this correlation is completely spurious because these shocks are drawn uh, completely independent. These processes are completely independent. To illustrate the spurious correlation a bit further, let's just separate the whole 1,000 time period into four equally spaced uh, periods of 250 time periods each. So we see in the first period, the blue dots, we have a similar correlation than in the overall. Um, time span, but if you move to the second sub period, suddenly the correlation becomes zero or even slightly negative. If you then move further to the third or fourth sub period, the correlation even becomes uh, strongly negative. And here's the problem. If you would then use um, the second sub period, for example, to make a prediction about what follows afterwards in the third sub period, you would get it completely wrong because the correlation suddenly changed. Now the drift is one reason why we have this strong correlation, but even if you look at the random walks without drift, we still see a significant substantial correlation, in this case, a negative correlation of almost minus 0.5. Even so again, these processes are completely independent from each other. And this just happens because just by chance, these processes exhibit some extensional trending behavior and it happens that they just diverge in different directions. This gen which is strong negative correlation. So this is something we would not um, observe that strongly, at least um, with stationary processes. Okay, does it mean we can't do anything with non-stationary processes? Uh, the general answer is it depends. If the processes are independent, there's really not much we can do. But let's generate one process, the blue one here, 
as a function essentially of the other one. The red process is X, is again just a random walk with drift. The blue process follows from the red process. It, in, it inherits the properties from the red process. And we see they nicely essentially co-move with each other. And in fact, it turns out that the blue process is essentially just about one half of the red process. And this ratio remains constant over time. That is what constitutes a co-integrating relationship between these two uh, non-stationary variables. So essentially at any point in time, our best guess for the blue process might be, would be half of the red process if we know the value of the red process. Or in other words, a linear combination between the two processes would yield a stationary process. That's what we see in the lower right picture. That's the so-called error correction term, the deviation from this long run equilibrium. And the deviation from this long run equilibrium is just a nice stationary process. And also, if we look again at the scatter plot, um, the correlation better, we see that now all of these dots nicely align along this regression line. So there's clearly some fundamental underlying relationship between these two processes. Okay, let's go back to the actual Bitcoin data. Um, first of all, we see both variables are clearly non-stationary. They are upward trending. Question is, are they trend-stationary or really just following random walks? Um, a defining pattern of the stock to flow ratio are really these jumps. So maybe let's first separate the jumps, which are completely deterministic. They are just deterministically um, determined by the um, halving events, the halving of the rewards for the miners. Let's separate these jumps from um, the effects of the remaining fluctuations. And here I've just mechanically taken out the jumps at the, from the halving effect events um, from the stock to flow ratio. And instead, I will look at the effect as well of the halving of the minus rewards. Well, the stock to flow ratio now, um, at, let's say after accounting for maybe a halving period specific time trend looks very stationary. It just tends to fluctuate, fluctuate randomly um, around without deviating much into one or the other direction, which is kind of different for the Bitcoin price. We could apply statistical tests um, to see whether these variables are actually stationary, trans-stationary or not. And typically these statistical tests, I don't want to talk too much about them, um, would um, confirm um, or at least not reject the hypothesis that the Bitcoin price um, tends to be um, a non-stationary variable and the stock to flow ratio, at least after accounting for the halving effects and the potentially different time trends within these halving periods um, uh, is likely a stationary process. But eventually for what I'm going to do, we actually don't necessarily need to do these um, separate tests um, for stationarity or non-stationarity. We could just estimate a model that allows for the combination of both stationary and non-stationary variables. This model explains the log Bitcoin price, not just by the current stock to flow ratio as in the very beginning, but it also adds the time lags of the Bitcoin price and the time lags of the stock to flow ratio. In addition, I would also like to um, throw in the rewards to capture the um, deterministic effects of the um, halving breaks. Now what, Adding these time lags in particular of the locked uh, price um, implies is, it implies that this model uh, can allow for the Bitcoin price to be a pure random walk as a special case, which the initial model that we just were running the regression of the lock price and stock to flow ratio uh, couldn't. By allowing this special case, um, we could essentially distinguish 
I can essentially distinguish between um, a situation where the price is really just a random walk or where it may be driven by the structure flow ratio. Um, let's maybe look at a slightly different um, formulation of the model. Um, this is really just a reformulation of the initial so called order requested distributed lag model. Um, and this reformulation uh, might be easier to interpret. It says that the change now in the log Bitcoin price is essentially a function of the deviations of the price from its long run equilibrium, assuming that a long run equilibrium might exist. And if it exists, this long run equilibrium would be determined by the stock to flow ratio and maybe a linear time trend. So this coefficient beta here is essentially just the same coefficient um, from an interpretation uh, point of view as we had in the very beginning. In addition, um, we could also, because we had these lags initially in the model for certain short run effects that would just tell us um, uh, whether we could potentially predict um, the Bitcoin price over the next couple of periods while the long run equilibrium really aims to make a um, prediction more uh, into the future. What happens with our um, data without showing you the details is essentially that these short run effects don't really matter. So let's uh, just remove them from the model. Uh, the model becomes even simpler. And another key parameter in this model is this coefficient alpha that I didn't yet talk about. So suppose this long run equilibrium exists. What does the coefficient alpha tells us? It tells us how strongly does the price react to a deviation from the long run equilibrium? So suppose the price is too high relative to its equilibrium, then alpha would tell us by how much the price then would be expected to readjust downwards uh, towards the equilibrium. So clearly there are two um, key parameters, alpha and beta, um, that we need to look at. And for the existence of such a long run equilibrium, of course, we need that beta is non zero. But we also need that alpha is non zero, because if alpha is zero, then essentially this whole term here drops out. If there's no reaction to a deviation from the long run equilibrium, then essentially there cannot exist any long run equilibrium. So both alpha and beta need to be equal to zero. Fortunately, there is a nice statistical test that we can apply um, and that test allows for the stock to flow ratio in particular to be both stationary or non-stationary. Um, and this test we could use to check whether alpha and beta um, are equal to zero. What happens with the data here is actually that we cannot reject the null hypothesis that alpha and beta e are equal to zero. But this would be evidence um, that such a long run equilibrium does not exist. So if it doesn't exist, we could just remove this term. What's left is just a simple model, very similar to what uh, Manuel just showed us um, with his two dummy variables. Instead of the two dummy variables, I essentially just have the um, log rewards. The nice thing about the log rewards is, instead of the dummy variables, because we know how the rewards look like in the future, that's just deterministically given, we could use, still use this model to make some uh, predictions, some forecasts. So let's first estimate this model. Again, I don't show you the, the numbers. Um, um, what would happen or what we would find is again, similar to, to Manuel's results, that essentially this coefficient gamma is not statistically significantly different from zero. So you cannot establish any effect statistically of these log rewards on the Bitcoin price. And if you then remove the log rewards from the model, what's left is really just that the log price depends on its price in the previous period, plus possibly some drift. And this drift term would then be statistically positive. So we would have a random walk with drift. Um, now let's assume for a moment, and that will be a last picture that I want to show you. Um, let's assume for the moment this gamma is not zero. Um, and in fact, whenever you estimate the model, gamma is 
usually not exactly equal to zero. Cannot you can just not statistically reject the um, hypothesis that it is equal to zero. So let's uh, suppose we forget about the statistical significance, take the, est the point estimate at face value and make some predictions. And I warn you um, ahead of the next picture, what I show you now is not to be taken too serious, basically because this effect is not statistically significantly different from zero. What we get is something like this. The gray area is essentially the drift over time adjusted for the halving periods given by the halving in the log rewards, or by the halving in the rewards. Um, so the boundaries are really just arbitrary, I just pick them based on the peak and the, the dwarfs. Um, but the direction essentially indicates what this model would predict um, for the future drift of the Bitcoin. And we see it would essentially uh, reverse and go down again. If you like, um, you could actually add rainbow colors, then you would get a rainbow that touches the graph twice, um, as many rainbows do in, uh, in reality. Uh, but once again, um, as I said, don't take this too seriously. This coefficient is essentially not statistically significantly different from zero. And what we have is just a random warp with drift and the prediction for this random warp with drift would just be given by this blue triangle. And by the very nature of a random walk, it's essentially unbounded above and below. It can easily go through the roof, it can easily go down through the floor, or it could just walk around somewhere in the middle. And that's, uh, I want to finish, and I'm happy to discuss further um, now and in the panel session later.